This morning, we have invited three outstanding plenary speakers who are leaders in their respective fields. They will share with us their insights and views on this year's theme and the future challenges that we face in our professions. Due to weather conditions in Minneapolis, Dr. Osterley was unable to get here. So Dr. Tim Dennison of Medtronic Minneapolis, Minnesota will be giving the talk, Converging Microelectronics to Implantable Medical Devices. Dr. Dennison received his AB degree in physics from the University of Chicago, his master's and PhD from MIT. Tim is the director of neuroengineering for Medtronic Neuromodulation and a Medtronic technical fellow. In this role, Tim helps guide the creation of sensor, actuator, algorithmic building blocks, and architectural frameworks for future devices intended to treat nervous system disorders. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Dennison. Thank you, so obviously I'm not Dr. Osterley, um, but <clears throat> there actually is an interesting theme that ties into our first slide, and that's the marriage of an engineer and a clinician and coming up with new products and also new opportunities, sometimes in ways that you never foresaw such as this opportunity. And so in Minnesota, you know, we have a lot of snow and Dr. Osterley would like to actually apologize. We actually had 17 inches of snow over the last 24 hours. And that's what's actually held him up from getting to San Francisco. <clears throat> but when we look back and reflect on the history of Medtronic, it actually is in all seriousness, this interaction of engineers and clinicians working together, starting with our founder, Earl Bakken, who had a medical equipment service company in a garage in Minnesota, working with Dr. Lillehei, who was a surgeon at the University of Minnesota. And what Dr. Lillehei was doing at that time was surgeries on children to fix cardiac defects that they essentially established at birth. The issue with fixing these defects is over the next two to three days, the child actually had a heart block. And so they required an external pacing circuit in order to keep their heart active and keep the child alive. So the issue with these devices at that time is that they were large, weighed 100 pounds, you had to push them around on a block, and generally they were uh, plugged into the wall socket. And so keeping in the theme of Dr. Osterley uh, missing this uh, lecture, we have severe weather all the time in Minnesota, not just in the winter. And during a, a thunderstorm in a, on a summer evening, we lost electricity throughout Minneapolis the pacemakers went down in the hospital unit and a child died. And so Dr. Osterley approached, um, or, I'm sorry, uh, Dr. Lillehei approached Earl Bakken and said, you need to fix this problem for me. I need some kind of circuit that will uh, prevent this from ever happening again. So believe it or not, uh, Earl Bakken was a, quite an enthusiast of hobby magazines and including popular electronics. And in the 1956 issue, they had a metronome circuit. So at that time, transistors were relatively novel. Um, but you know, to Earl Bakken's credit, he realized that this cardiac pacemaker essentially had the attributes of a metronome that you use for a piano. And so the first transistorized pacemaker was born using those principles, essentially copied directly out of uh, the Popular Electronics magazine, and was put into place. And at that time, the regulatory environment was quite different. The first prototype of the system was out and uh, released within a week and used on patients. There's one thing I'd like to point out, as you'll notice the first prototype device had knobs that are actually externalized on the system. The second generation that became the full product, it's a little difficult to see here, had those knobs depressed and inside of the box. So you can imagine if you give a child a pacing box, you don't necessarily want to externalize those knobs because the first thing they're gonna do is turn them. And that's not very bright on a pacemaking device. <coughs> So that kind of motivates this high-level block diagram of a of medical system from a systems context. Now, my goal is not to walk you in great detail through this block diagram. It's to give you a feel of the complexity that's involved from the element of the sensors to the control algorithms, the power management, the processing, the telemetry, all of these elements that one has to consider in a modern design, especially from the capabilities of an integrated circuit that could be brought to bear. 
The box that's highlighted in blue is system control. That's an uh, integrated circuits name for the physician. So kind of coming in and actually coordinating the entire system and keeping it running in some meaningful way, much as a pilot comes into an advanced airliner and actually controls the uh, underlying mechanisms. So the intent of this talk by Dr. Osterley and what I'll try to convey here is that view from the system control and not the details of transistor physics, but what they can bring to bear in terms of themes for technology from a clinical standpoint. And those themes are threefold for this talk. One is how can we use this technology to reduce the scale of devices? What can we do to provi provide more dynamic and adaptive therapies for patients? And finally, what are the advanced management capabilities that we might bring to bear for, for our patients to give them better care? So this is an example of a pacemaker system in 2011. Um, some of the key attributes are an implantable device, the IPG, implantable pulse generator, also called the CAN in uh, lingo. It's implanted in your chest, and then I'll play this again. Then uh, multiple numbers of leads are then routed through the venous system down into the heart, both in, you'll see in this case, a two-lead system, one in the atrium and one in the ventricle, and they coordinate the pulsing to try to keep synchronization with the heart. And these devices are actually quite adaptive in, in time and can respond to the needs of the patient. So these pacemakers have obviously evolved over the last 50 years from that original metronome circuit, um, starting from the left, moving chronologically to the right. You can see the changes both in the material properties, um, shifting from plastics um, harder and harder resins to now the kind of the ubiquitous titanium can uh, moving over to the right. But Im embedded within this, there's also a evolution of the capabilities of the device that mimic and mirror the evolution of integrated circuit technology that we've seen. And so some of those uh, concepts are the ability of the pacemaker to both sense the inherent activity of the heart, so it can shut down when pacing is not required, and the other element that uh, is in there that's quite uh, of quite of high value for our patients is the ability to adaptively change based on their activity levels. And so we can sort of respond to the need for pacing in real time through the use of accelerometry. So if you look at this evolution, it's actually been sort of in a continuum chain going to, from uh, 1960 to 2011. And one of the areas that we want to discuss in this talk looking to the future is something that's a little bit more disruptive in its evolution. And one of the things I need to point out as you, we kind of jump to the next slide is, these are not the leads, these are actually the antennas for the system. So these are these two, uh, these two uh, kind of tethers coming out of the early devices. Those are the antennas that uh, were externalized at that time and brought in and later brought inside in uh, future generations. The reason I point that out is to help give this a little crisper view of the kind of scaling that we're talking about is this is a uh, modern device. These are actually the lead systems. They plug into the connector block and then they're coiled and routed through the venous system to the heart, one to the atrium, one to the ventricle. And what we're looking at in the future is trying to both reduce the scale of the device, but also look at eliminating those needs. So ponder for a moment how many times your heart beats in a day. About 100,000 times. So in terms of an engineering challenge, kind of think about that. You've got these electrode wires routing through your body You've got a dynamic system, coiling, turning, you know, churning the blood through your heart 100,000 times per day. So this is quite a challenging mechanical problem you know, in terms of building a robust system. The other thing about leads is they require extra power in order to deliver therapy to the heart. And so looking at ways to eliminate the leads is uh, quite interesting in terms of its clinical opportunity. The other opportunity of kind of this miniaturization, if you will, of the system is it gives new opportunities of how you might deliver this therapy. And so this is a video showing the uh, delivery of this leadless pacer concept into the heart using a endoscope. So kind of coming in with a, a more precisely a catheter-like technology where instead of cutting down, inserting the leads through the edge of a vein, you can actually go very much like a... Uh, cardiac stent system. So I'll play that one more time. So we route up the device, come through a minimally invasive procedure, doesn't necessarily, necessarily require an expert surgeon. You can place that device 
in a uh, very rapid amount of time, and then it kicks off and goes pacing. Of course, this is quite a significant step in the technology curve, and it ties very much into the uh, discussions at this conference. You know, how, how is this kind of downsizing enabled? And there are a multitude of uh, kind of synergistic uh, technologies that need to come together at the same time. So one, we have to worry about the energy. You know, in order to provide that chronic pacing, one has to have an energy source. And so, of course, everyone's looking at new battery technology and new ways to actually perhaps harvest energy from the heart. Although at this time, as shown in the slide, you know, we're looking at uh, trying to achieve it with a battery. You need to build those batteries small, but you also need to improve, improve the packing efficiency and make it a little more physiological. Married up with this are really breakthroughs in low power electronics, trying to come up with new ways of sensing and processing information uh, where every, uh, every microwatt, every joule counts. And uh, that's a big focus. And then finally, at the third step is how do you actually put together the energy sources, marry those with the electronics, and then package them in an effective way so you can hit the appropriate form factor. So all of these elements actually need to come together at once in order to provide a viable solution. In the future, is this where we'll stop? Um, we don't think so. And so the opportunities actually to be even more disruptive include trying to do the more than more concept and apply it within the medical implant. And that includes bringing to bear planarization technology, how do we put more sensors and telemetry systems onto a wafer, and then use wafer bonding to build up energy sources and put this together into a hermetic package. And so kind of, let's see if I can roll that again, kind of shot through. Uh, there we go. Try to be a jockey with the slide deck here. Thank you, always to the rescue. So, you know, it's kind of looking at these, starting with the planarization and the different technologies that actually you can see even more so than that, leave this pacer coming in with the die stacks, the MEMS accelerometers, looking at how do we actually bring in the sealing of these, keep it hermetic over the order of decades, and then still at the same time provide a meaningful energy source that's going to power this thing up and allow you to communicate with the outside world. And so this is kind of the area where we see long-term even greater opportunities for disruption. And this is an early prototype from one of our research labs, kind of giving you an idea of the scale and the opportunity. But you know, kind of stepping back, it's not just about the size, it's about the capabilities and about the economics of building up an implant. You know, as you all know, we're in a, a period of time where the healthcare economics and the demographics uh, are quite uh, evolving quite rapidly. And at the same time, companies like Medtronic and the other major device uh, manufacturers are trying to say, how can we better serve the emerging markets? And one of the opportunities that we see there is to bring to bear the kind of cost savings technology that we saw within the semiconductor market and apply it in the design and the manufacture of a medical implant. And this kind of technology is what we see as the path towards getting there. So it's not just about the size, it's about the capability and the cost and bringing all those things together at the same time. So this was focusing on the kind of cardiac side about the scaling of the devices. This has been the uh, kind of the cornerstone, if you will, of the medical device market, serving bradycardia, which means a slow heartbeat, uh, heart failure, um, which we'll talk a little bit more in the future, and then tachycardia is where your heart's beating too fast and we need to actually do a defibrillation and slow it down. But if you step back, we're electrical beings. You know, the signaling throughout our body, the diseases that we have, are all rooted to a certain extent or we have a degree of freedom that's available to us in the electrical system. And so we don't stop at just the heart. And you know, these are examples actually of devices out today Ones with an asterisk are an investigational device or a humanitarian device exemption. The ones without an asterisk are actually main products, commercialized products within the medical industry. So these range across the entire nervous system of the body, as you can see, from the brain for the treatment of Parkinson's disease, tremor, looking in the future towards some of the psychological diseases, epilepsy, also the treatment of chronic pain. So trying to treat someone's chronic pain through stimulation of the spinal cord and also going down lower into the digestive tract into gastroparesis, 
and believe it or not, into urinary incontinence, and now the exploration of fecal incontinence. We really want to drive home these technologies as we bring them forward are not just enabling innovations in the cardiac realm. You can see as if I want to interact with my nervous system electrically through the body, scaling these devices also has an opportunity there as well. It gives you a much greater degree of freedom in where you can place these uh, devices. But let's talk a little bit about expanding into the nervous system because this sort of transitions into the next area where clinicians are interested in what integrated circuits can do to enhance the capabilities of an implant, specifically in adding more sensors. So this is a schematic of a deep brain stimulation system today. It looks very much like cardiac technology. So you have an implanted imp uh, pulse generator, a set of electrodes, and then instead of going to the heart, they're actually routed up into the central regions of the brain. So from the basal ganglia circuits, the thalamus. And these central targets are actually <coughs> um, a key player in diseases such as Parkinson's, tremor, um, dystonia. And so that's why we go down into those central areas. Some of the deeper control systems, if you will, kind of your electrical engineering intuition is these centralized circuits are kind of the feedback control mechanism that helps to drive computation for motor symptoms and other areas of interest. So the name deep brain stimulation, um, you know, in terms of, uh, it's, it's actually a little bit of a technical term. The deep is actually referring to the fact that you're going down into these structures as opposed to being on the surface of the brain. So this is a schematic of a system today. I'm gonna show you a video, um, I apologize about showing kind of a newsreel, but what we wanna do is drive home the impact that this device has on a patient and I couldn't actually line up a patient to come today, which is, would have been my preference. So instead, we're going to do the next best thing and show a newsreel to really drive home what this means for uh, patients suffering from a motor disease. Good morning, America. I'm Charles Gibson. And I'm Robin Roberts on this Thursday, April 17, 2003. For some of the 300,000 Americans suffering from the neurological disorder dystonia, the FDA has just approved an implantable pacemaker, which could tame the involuntary muscle contractions, which makes the severest form of dystonia so debilitating. For years, Emily and Ed C. Walensky thought they had a perfect little boy, without a clue that their precious only child harbored an ailment so treacherous and mysterious, it would eventually tear their world apart. This is what Ed's life had become his muscles twisting and contorting his body into bizarre postures, crippling him with painful spasms and uncontrollable movements. The doctors implanted two electrodes in the part of Ed's brain that causes his dystonia. These wires will now constantly emit a steady stream of electrical pulses that will allow his muscles to move freely. This is Ed just eight days after surgery. The turnaround is remarkable. DBS is, quite simply, working like a pacemaker for the brain. It doesn't cure his dystonia, but it controls it without destroying any brain tissue. It's wonderful. I, I, I just thank God for, you know, giving this to me. Today, Ed C. Walensky is not only walking, he's driving a car and working as a computer programmer. So this is just one example of how going in as a circuit designer within a patient's nervous system and adding therapeutic pacing can have a positive benefit. And so there are up to 75,000 uh, patients that have been served with this kind of technology so far, and it's rapidly growing. But when we look towards the future, kind of how do, how do we evolve this? And so you might have heard within the reporter's language, it's like a pacemaker for the brain. In some elements it is, in terms of its ability to deliver electrical therapy, but in some elements, it's actually still a bit behind. It's a bit like the old metronome concept from the first generation of pacemakers. And so to drive home the idea of it's like a pacemaker for the brain, this is actually an x-ray of a system showing the electronics, the battery, the wires going up, and then the electrodes going into the central target of the patient. But there is no sensing. So the sensing in the algorithm loop, if you will, is provided by the clinician. And so the future state of where we'd like to take these neurostimulators is better characterizing the interplay between the circuitry of the nervous system and the circuitry that we can bring to bear as electrical engineers and marrying those two up in an effective way for therapy. And those are, of course, always generational. So we start out with the augmenting the present approach by adding better 
quantitative diagnostics for clinicians. You, know, you can think you come back in every three to six months, your physician asks, how are you doing? And you're kind of giving a verbal overview of how the last six months have go. How can we augment that with more quantitative data for feedback? That can improve the physician as the control loop. You know, physicians, the physicians are playing a role in the feedback for the patient's therapy. And then in the future, looking towards sensing signals and embedding control loops within the device itself, all with the concept of the fact that there are two circuits interplaying here, not just one. So let's talk about it, a couple examples of that. Here's an example of an unmet need um, in the spinal cord stimulation for chronic pain. You can see the electrodes are fixed with respect to the spinal cord, but the spinal cord itself is tethered um, a, so the electrodes are fixed with respect to the spinal column. The spinal cord is actually freely tethered on the side. So as the patient changes their posture, the spinal cord moves with respect to the electrodes. And so I'm kind of kick that off again. And so the issue is kind of represented in red is the volume of tissue activation, as we call it. So this is the amount of the nervous system that's actually being driven by the electricity. And you can see that can be quite dynamic. And so that can be an issue for the patient. They have to update their, their therapy through their programmer as they're changing their posture through the day. So the kind of technologies that we're evolving and bringing to bear within, uh, within our industry really can take advantage of the evolution of consumer devices. And so over the last decade, you kind of see this problem that our clinicians have described, of, hey, my patients have problems when they're changing their posture. And then we can say, you know what? The Wii, the iPhone, you know, my electrical gadgets, they've solved that issue. They know how to do this. And we can leverage that technology with the adaptations of preserving performance while lowering the power, and then start to use that and marry it within an implant to con basically provide continuous measurement of the patient's posture, and then perhaps close a feedback loop. And so indeed, there is a um, device, it's been C marked, and it's an investigational use in the United States, but it actually has such a feedback reflex. And so if, with the three-axis accelerometer inside, as the patient changes posture, we can adaptively change the amplitude with the goal of preserving the volume of tissue that's activated. So this is kind of a simple example of how one can bring uh, some of the advanced technologies that are being developed to bear in an implant. There are even some more exciting opportunities um, in the future uh, in terms of brain interfacing. And these get into the direct electrical measurement of the activity within the nervous system. So there's a lot of work going on both within the academic space and within industry of understanding how do we build chips that can chronically sense activity and use it in some meaningful way in a clinical setting. And so this is a snapshot of one of our chips um, presented at ISSCC a few years ago, which has now been reduced onto a hybrid and into a uh, early stage research device for animal studies. And you know, similar work is going on at a number of universities and uh, other business sites. But what's kind of interesting and what I'm, what I'm actually pleased about is it's getting out of the realm of just a simple chip system and truly making, starting to make some translation into a research setting. So this is one example um, from a motor prosthesis. The application space here is for someone who has, say, a spinal cord injury, uh, loses the ability to uh, control their limbs through a, a high-level uh, spinal injury. So what we want to do is directly read out the signals from the brain with their intention to control something, in this case a cursor, so a one-dimensional cursor. And using a non-human primate as the model that's been trained on how to control the system, we actually drop in our externalized research device and compare it to off-the-shelf equipment. So we start to get a feel for how well does an implantable technology work against the existing rack-mounted equipment that's used today. So what's nice is you see it represents the full control loop that one might bring to bear in a number of therapies. We're going to sense the signals from the brain, extract the meaningful information, and then use it to control an actuator, in this case a cursor. So here's an example of the cursor running in real time. The non-human primate's been trained and gets a reward when it uh, adjusts the, the uh, orange cursor to cross over the green arc in an appropriate manner. And what's um, interesting about this is it actually models fairly nicely a number of algorithms for uh, 
closed loop systems that have been explored. If you, if you look at the engineering equations for the signal processing and what they're thinking of for uh, diseases like epilepsy and perhaps Parkinson's disease in the future, there's kind of a nice uniform theme work that uh, plays across all of these. So it is good for that. I added in this bullet used to estimate a receiver operating characteristic as a system. And so why, you know, why did I put that in there? It's because clinicians really don't care about our circuit specs. They don't necessarily want to know, you know, how well is the noise floor of the amplifier, you know, how, what's the power draw? They want to know, are you getting the cursor across with good sensitivity and good specificity? And so one of the key areas that the integrated circuits uh, field is taking this is to better come up with ways of validating technologies within this clinical domain. The last thing I want to touch on this point is the, the third bullet. The understanding of how the brain is functioning or not functioning in diseases is still very much an unknown. And so technologies have a role both in current products but also they have a very important role in enabling the research that's required to enable the future generations of products. And so it's very exciting to be here at ISSCC, see a lot of the work that's coming out of academics labs that will actually enable that baseline understanding of how the system works and how we can better treat it. And so don't lose sight of that. It's not just about an immediate product over the next three to five years. It's also enabling the key basic understanding of how we might build better systems over the next decades. So this is fine and good. You know, we've got systems that are scaling, we've got new sensors and new control algorithms that are coming to bear that can provide adaptive therapies, but what are we going to do with this information? How do we actually make information work for us? And this is the last part of the discussion, it's starting to think ahead towards patient management. So a key technology tied into the ISSCC for enabling better patient management and making this information useful is remote wireless management of devices. So Dr. Osterley um, studies this actually very intently and he was listing some of the technologies that he thinks are the most critical in uh, bringing this patient management to bear. And so those include implanted and wearable sensors, distance telemetry, handheld communication, broadband, data storage analysis, but also discussing it with him um, in preparation for this talk is how do you just manage this enormous amount of information? What are we going to do when millions of patients start uploading their diagnostics in real time? How is that information going to be sorted? How would I take information from this entire room, each one of you uploading, and decide which one of you is at risk for hypertension? That's another key element of this that needs to be carefully thought through. The key link though that's starting to come to bear is the telemetry. So obviously in an implant, um, telemetry is a, um, essentially a must-have. You know, we have a skin barrier. How are you going to make adjustments within the device? So one of the earliest technologies that was brought to bear in a device was a telemetry s system. Generally these are inductive in nature, uh, historically. So with the data rates that we had, and the need for a kind of a clinical follow-up, a proximal inductive telemetry system was acceptable. Especially when you look at what the, some of the original generation devices actually, ha what you would get a screwdriver and your nurse would have a screwdriver with a sharp edge on it and they would actually stick it through your skin and basically turn a trim pot to adjust your pacing rate. And so, you know, if everyone wanted to quickly move to telemetry. And so we had the inductive systems then as the data rate started to grow and the application spaces started to expand, inductive telemetry wasn't enough. We had to get into the realm of more of an RF, a far field uh, sort of solution. And this has grown in the industry into the applications in the mixed space, as well as looking at some of the applications of Wi-Fi. But within the implant itself, uh, at Medtronic, we tend to be biased toward the uh, medical information band. How is it used? Kind of some of the typical telemetry use cases today. Uh, it's used at the implant. The, uh, you can imagine you have a patient laid out on a table. There's a surgical field that's been constructed around them that is meant to be sterile. 
So you want to communicate with the device, you want to test the device, but you don't want to actually break over that sterile field and put the patient at risk for infection. So having a telemetry system that can do that from a distance and still have an effective communication is quite a, uh, quite a clinical need that is met with the existing systems. Also, you come in office. Your device has been storing diagnostics on you over the last several months. You come in, you sit down, you want to upload those diagnostics as quickly as possible with the, with the minimal burden on the patient. The telemetry system provides that today. Another emerging area that gives opportunity is remote monitoring, kind of thinking about pre-scheduled diagnostic checkups on a device. You know, as we talked about, these devices are in a very extreme environment. They're seeing contraction, mechanical transactions, uh, mechanical um, locate, translocations on the order of 100,000 per day with their lead systems. You can actually create, and these exist today um, with the, med the major medical device players, these pre-scheduled diagnostic checks. So at the side of your bed, you have a little pod. It talks to your device, basically communicates everything is A-OK. -okay. It gives a certain level of confidence for the patient. It also enables the clinician to do some periodic follow-ups from the field so they can get the information back into the, into the clinic and make a, uh, make a diagnosis about whether they need to bring you in for additional follow-up or not. So in the future, one of the big areas that uh, Dr. Osterley and his team of uh, clinicians sees is really evolving that remote follow-up and making it more powerful. And so one area in particular where there is a strong initiative is in the monitoring of heart failure. The reason for this, heart failure accounts in the U.S. alone for $35 billion a year in medical costs. So it's the number one reason people are checking into the hospital. There's an interesting component of heart failure, which is as your heart fails, the first thing it will start to do is kick back pressure into the lungs, your pulmonary circuit. So that's where you hear the congestive heart failure, the pressure builds, you, know, you remember your basic engineering, you get a strong pressure pushing back, it starts to actually push fluid out of your, uh, out of your pulmonary circuit and back into your, into your lungs, and hence the uh, symptoms that show up. But what's interesting is the time lag. This isn't, you know, a lot of times people think about implants, that things happen on the order of minutes. The time between the pressure back up in the pulmonary system and when you start to show your symptoms is on the order of a few days. So if we could actually log that soon, telemetry that information to your clinician, they could take appropriate action to avoid sending you to a, a they could take appropriate action that would avoid you needing to check into the emergency room and having an emergent situation. And so where we kind of pull together all the elements of this talk, the ability to scale devices, the ability to have sensors and diagnostics, and then employ uh, telemetry is in this concept of the active diagnostic. And so once again, you can think of putting in a, a catheter, putting in a micro-miniature sensing device with the active telemetry system that would give you the capability to chronically monitor and track the pressures in a pulmonary circuit with the goal, of course, of avoiding a uh, trip to the emergency room or something worse. So these technologies are all on the cusp of the future. They're all being explored in advanced uh, research labs, both within Medtronic and in the broader community. Some of the other opportunities in terms of getting more connectivity between the patient and their caregiver is shown here. Each of the stars are areas of active interest within the medical community. You know, the treatment of heart failure we just talked about, diabetes management, trying to give coaching, trying to give chronic monitoring, hypertension, uh, ischemia, these are all areas that have profound medical consequences, but we think can be, the care can be significantly improved through chronic monitoring and telemetry of information. Then in the future, looking towards even more expanded areas in terms of what information we provide about epilepsy to a clinician, such as you know, what's your seizure burden rate, uh, how well are you responding to medication, a whole multitude of opportunities are there, but all relying on this connectivity, remote monitoring, and really getting into disease management. I think we're going to have to step back and be thoughtful about how we're going to parse through this information and turn raw data into meaningful clinical insights and you know, help gain, gain the, uh, so that it's actually working for the clinician and not overloading them with too much data. 
So of course, this is bigger than Medtronic and it's bigger than the medical device industry. And so kind of if we step back and say, what does it take to pull together an entire network of devices? It's not just about the sensors and it's not just about the server applications that are helping the clinician. We have an entire network of connectivity that needs to be dealt with. And of course, these are gonna require the work of a huge number of companies, almost every one of them sitting in this room. So this is gonna be all of us working together that's gonna bring about this capability of patient management. But you know, as Dr. Osterley was talking to me last night, he thinks this is the revolution that's coming in the medical care. That's this idea of remote patient management and chronic diagnostic. So just to wrap, we talked about kind of the three main levels that the system controller cares about, our clinician, these recurring themes. Keep your eye out. How do we make these devices smaller so they're less of a burden for the patient? Much, of it, much less of an annoyance, but still providing the, the job that they need to provide. How can we make our therapies even more dynamic and adaptive to the patient's needs? And also, how can we take advantage of the information that's now being collected in the implant and get that into the hands of the clinician for remote follow-up and better patient management? I always like to close, as does Dr. Osterley, with re remembering what this is about. It's not about integrated circuits. It's about treating patients. And so just within Medtronic sphere of technology, we're helping right now about uh, one patient every five seconds with our different therapies. But I got on to the, uh, talked to some of my colleagues, both at Medtronic and some of our uh, competitors, and our estimates are about 100 cardiac pacemakers were implanted during my talk around the world and two deep brain stimulators. And so this is the kind of, scales we're talking about, these are the number of patients that can be helped with our technology. But all the future innovations are going to depend on you. And so have a great ISSCC, learn what you can, help us solve these problems. Thank you very much.